The United States is raising concern over cheap Chinese products. The U.S. fears that overproduction of certain goods by China will hurt American businesses and workers. And as Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said while traveling to Beijing recently, this isn't just an American problem. Our concern about overcapacity is not animated by anti-China sentiment or a desire to decouple. Rather, it's driven by a desire to prevent global economic dislocation and move toward a healthy economic relationship with China. And Mark Wu joins me now for more. He's a professor of law at Harvard University, where he specializes in international trade and international economic law. Thank you so much for being with us. So what are we talking about here? What kind of Chinese exports is the U.S. concerned about? This week, the president is most concerned about uh, Chinese steel, for which he's asked uh, for tripling of tariffs. Uh, and then today, the uh, Office of U U.S. Trade Representative announced an investigation into Chinese shipbuilding. Uh, but there's a whole suite of other products that uh, China is accused of overcapacity or building and flooding the market with. Uh, this includes electronic vehicles. It also includes um, semiconductors and the like. It's all part of a larger industrial policy plan that China has, which threatens the president's manufacturing revival and also poses challenges to U.S. trading partners as well. And, Professor, is are we talking here about goods that are, quote-unquote, cheap because they are subsidized by the Chinese government or because they are actually low quality? It's largely because they're subsidized by the Chinese government. Um, there is, in some sectors, a labor advantage. But once you get to these higher-end products, um, that labor advantage is less significant. And then on some of these, what China has done is China has built out scale. So there's also scale advantages that they have as well. And um, on this question of the global economy, the Treasury Secretary um, mentioned that it wasn't just about the U.S., that there were global economic implications in the context of the G7 foreign ministers meeting, which is taking place this week. I've also read them talk about this is one of the great economic questions yet to be determined in the in this year and next, which is how much of effect on global trade these Chinese goods would have. How, how, is it, how can it have that big of an impact? Um, if you think about it, uh, one of the things China has been great at doing is building out at scale and then building out the infrastructure to push that out to the rest of the world. So China isn't just building electric vehicles. China is also building the ships that are able to transport these electric vehicles. And they're threatening to flood the world with these products. Um, China's built out much of the infrastructure in uh, 5G technology. Um, China is also uh, looking to now dominate some of the components. Um, and China has different parts of the supply chain that they use to their advantage as well. So all of this has implications, even in an integrated world. Um, the Chinese hold on some of these. Um, a lot of them certain advantages that are going to have spillover effects to not just the U.S., but Europe and elsewhere, and with ripple effects for um, jobs and also for security. And so how does this get adjudicated, um, especially since the Chinese could say, well, your CHIPS Act, America, is subsidizing the low-cost production of chips, and that's all meant to pin us down. So, you know, what's good for the goose? But presumably there are international trade agreements that the U.S. will be trying to, to appeal to to get some of this taken care of. So that is exactly what the Chinese are saying, right? And um, part of the frustration here has been uh, over the past two decades, the U.S. and to a lesser extent Europe has tried to resort to these international trade agreements to try to get China to scale back on these subsidies and industrial policies. They've proven ineffective because of some nuances and how those agreements have been interpreted. And so um, we've gotten now to a point where there's been significant enough of a job loss, significant enough of a threat, particularly with security repercussions, that the U.S. and Europe are now with responding, saying, if you can't beat them, join them. And so we are seeing that type of ripple effect. Uh, but on the Chinese side, their economy is facing such headwinds that there is no other option other than to scale up manufacturing. So in the near term, I have a hard time seeing how this is going to get educated. Rather, I think there are just more tensions to come. Huh. So so I was going to ask you what, and I'll still ask it, but what, what other leverage the U.S. might have with, with China? I could imagine it would be through its markets and its businesses. But if what you say is true, they're facing such headwinds, and this is the only way they maybe have to go. 
Yeah, I mean, the other types of leverage that the U.S. has is the U.S. can scale up what mm. it's doing. Um, that uh, U.S. can also put pressure on its allies to reroute its supply chains. That, to some extent, is what uh, the Biden trade policy has tried to do. Um, the other option, which the Chinese very much uh, take offense to, has been to use export controls. So a lot of these technologies are integrated, and uh, there are components or there are machines and so forth that China depends on the U.S. for and vice versa. And so you can weaponize those as well as a means to try to gain leverage. Mark Wu, professor of law at Harvard University. That was really helpful. Thank you.